Okay, let's start with a question for you. What is the biggest, newest warship in Southeast Asia just uh, sailed into Indonesian waters? And what if the ripples from that went way beyond just Indonesia? Yeah, it's not just about, you know, a single new ship hitting the water. Right. It feels like a genuine shift, maybe something in the regional power balance that, well, maybe folks didn't quite see coming this clearly. Hmm. Some might look and say, oh, it's another frigate. But when you dig in, it's different. Welcome to the deep dive. We're here to cut through that surface noise and really get into what matters. Today, it's all about the KRI Broage Aya 320. That's the one started life essentially on Italian drawing boards, now set to be a, uh, a real crown jewel for the Indonesian Navy. And this isn't just for show or simple patrols. It seems specifically engineered to project power. We're talking big contracts, detailed blueprints, serious, serious investment here. And what's really interesting, I think, is how Broegi sort of resets the conversation about naval strength in the region. You know, Southeast Asia often has this, let's call it a soft arms race. Okay, what do you mean by soft? Well, sometimes it seems more about status, right? Getting a few modern pieces of kit, but maybe there are gaps underneath in actual combat readiness or sustainment. Mm -hmm. Brawijaya, even with its own challenges we'll get into, it kind of flips that. It's a very clear statement. And it really highlights where maybe some other navies in the area are lagging. So it forces everyone else to ask, okay, are we actually ready for this level of capability? Exactly. That's the core question it raises. So our mission today for this deep dive Let's really unpack what this frigate brings to the table. What are its limits? What are the hidden costs? And crucially, what does it all mean for ASEAN, you know, as a group? What does it mean for China and for the other big players watching the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But first, maybe we should set the scene a bit more. The maritime environment there is just incredibly complex. Oh, massively. You've got thousands upon thousands of islands, trillions in trade flowing through narrow straits. Contested seas, overlapping claims. Right. Ambiguous lines on maps. And underneath it all, or flying overhead, you have this constant, almost shadowy presence of submarines, drones. It's busy. It's valuable. And yeah, it's tense. And the reality for many navies there has been, well, a struggle, hasn't it? Often undergunned, maybe underfunded, sometimes both. Definitely. You see a lot of navies dealing with older ships, maybe radar systems that aren't quite up to snuff against modern threats, limited anti-air defenses. Which, as we've seen elsewhere recently, can be a huge vulnerability. A single missile, a quiet submarine. It can neutralize older ships pretty quickly. They can become sort of digital tin cans. That's a stark way to put it, but yeah. yeah. And Indonesia's felt this pressure very directly. How so? Well, you hear about the foreign incursions into their waters, constant illegal fishing, and that um, persistent presence of Chinese Coast Guard ships or maybe militia vessels. Especially around sensitive areas like the Natuna Islands. Exactly. So for Indonesia, this maritime challenge isn't some abstract concept. It's happening daily right there on the water. It hits their sovereignty, their economy. So it all leads to this really tough strategic question for Jakarta, doesn't it? How do you build a navy that can actually defend this vast, complex territory and deter anyone thinking of pushing too hard? Without completely breaking the bank. Yeah, that's a tightrope. Okay, let's get into the hardware itself. KRI Brawijaya 320. What is this thing? You said it's more than just a frigate. It really is a leap capability-wise for Indonesia. Physically, it's big, around 143 meters long, full load displacement. Hmm. We're talking about 6,270 tons. Okay, 6,270 tons. Put that in perspective for us within ASEAN. Well, that pushes it well beyond your typical regional frigate size. It's actually closer to what some might call a light destroyer. This isn't a coastal boat. It's built for blue water, open ocean operations. Serious stuff. In performance, how does it move? Also impressive. Top speed is around 32 knot. That's pretty quick for a ship this size. Lets it redeploy fast if needed. Right. But maybe more importantly for Indonesia, its range. About 5,000 nautical miles cruising at a more economical speed, say 15 knots. So it can cover those huge ocean stretches Indonesia's responsible for. Yeah. Stay out longer without needing to dash back to port constantly. Exactly. That's crucial for an archipelago nation. Endurance matters as much as speed sometimes. And talk about the engine setup. Mm -hmm. It's got this uh, combined diesel and gas turbine system, Kodag. That's right, Kodag. It's a smart choice, gives you flexibility. How so? You get the gas turbines for those high-speed sprints when you really need to get somewhere fast, but then you have the diesel engines for efficient long-range cruising. Saves fuel, extends time on station. Best of both worlds, then. Speed when you need it, endurance for the long haul, 
Makes sense for Indonesia's geography. Definitely. It matches their operational needs quite well. Okay, let's talk teeth. The armament. This is where it gets really interesting, right? What's it carrying? It's packing a serious punch. Up front, there's a 127 millimeter Volcano main gun. Good for shelling, surface targets, accurate too. Okay. Then you've got a 76 millimeter Strails rapid fire gun. That's more for close in defense, fast targets, even anti-missile work. And the missiles. I understand it has a vertical launch system, VLS. Yes, VLS, that's key. Allows you to fire missiles quickly in any direction. It's fitted with silver launchers, A-43 or A-50 modules. And what goes in those launchers? Advanced surface-to-air missiles, SAMUS, specifically the Aster-15 and the longer-range Aster-30. So a proper air defense capability can protect itself, maybe other ships too. Absolutely. It creates a robust, layered air defense bubble. That's a significant upgrade. Plus, of course, it has dedicated anti-ship missiles for hitting other vessels. Right. And torpedo tubes for dealing with submarines, backed up by advanced sonar and sensors for finding them in the first place. Wow. So anti-air, anti-surface, anti-submarine. And comprehensive electronic warfare suites, jamming, detecting enemy radar, that sort of thing. Plus multifunction radars, giving it really good situational awareness. It's, well, it's the full package for a modern warship. And what about the crew and internal setup? I read something about modularity. Yeah, the standard crew is around 173, but it has these modular zones, extra bunks, basically space to bring on mission-specific teams. Like what quality teams? Could be special forces, could be a medical team for disaster relief, maybe extra intelligence specialists. It means the ship isn't just a pure warfighter, it can adapt its role. Mm -hmm. Makes it more versatile, maybe more cost effective in the long run. So summing up the hardware then, what this means for you listening is KRI Brawajaya isn't just some upgraded patrol vessel. Not at all. It's designed from the keel up to operate in contested waters, to cruise far, fight hard, detect threats, launch strikes, defend itself, and crucially, survive. For Indonesia, this is a massive step up in naval capability. A real statement. But, uh. and there's always a but with this kind of high-end military tech. Ah, uh, here we go. The reality check section. Because a fancy <laughs> ship on paper is one thing, right? right? Operating it effectively is another beast entirely. Precisely. Military power isn't just about the shiny hardware. It's money, it's maintenance, it's training, it's the whole ecosystem around it. So what are the big challenges or limits with a ship like Broyaya? Where do we start? Logistics. Sustainment. Think right. about it. A 6,000 plus ton warship. High-end sensors, complex missile systems, gas turbine engines, helicopters. Yeah. It needs huge logistical support. Specialized spare parts, which might have long lead times from Italy or elsewhere. Massive amounts of fuel. Dedicated docks that can handle a ship this size and draft. Dry docks for major repairs. Exactly. And a highly skilled workforce, both onboard and ashore, to maintain these complex systems. If a sophisticated radar panel or a turbine blade fails... It's not like popping down to the auto parts store. Not even close. It's a complex, potentially very lengthy process to diagnose, order, receive, and install a replacement. That means downtime. Potentially significant downtime. Okay, so the logistics tail is long and demanding. What about the people? The crew? Critically important. True effectiveness doesn't just come from having the Aster missiles or the fancy sonar. It comes from the crew being able to use it all under pressure as a team. You mean training? Intense, realistic, constant training anti-submarine warfare drills, hunting practice subs, air defense scenarios reacting to simulated missile attacks, damage control knowing how to fight fires, patch holes, electronic warfare using their systems, countering enemy systems. And doing it all together, maybe with other ships or aircraft. Yes, networked warfare. If that training isn't rigorous, isn't continuous, isn't realistic, then even the most powerful hardware can become, well, you called it a tin can earlier, maybe an ineffective metal flotilla. A very expensive, very visible target if it can't fight effectively. Sadly, yes. That's the risk. If the software, the human element, the training, the doctrine doesn't keep pace with the hardware. And even if it's well-trained and maintained, are there inherent vulnerabilities, especially in Southeast Asia's waters? Absolutely. Big ships are, well, big targets. They show up clearly on radar, on satellite imagery. Long-range missiles, stealthy submarines, even advanced drones pose threats. And what about closer in, those complex coastal areas? That's the littoral zone challenge. Shallow waters, lots of islands, lots of civilian traffic. It's easier for threats to hide. 
Think small, fast attack boats, maybe swarming drone attacks, sea mines. Things that can really negate some of the advantages of a large, powerful ship. They can certainly complicate things significantly. No single ship, not even one as capable as Broijaya, is invincible. It needs support air cover, other ships working with it in a network defense. Which brings us to the cost. This wasn't cheap. Not at all. The contract for two of these ships was reported around $1.18 billion. That's roughly, what, USD $1.25 billion? Wow. That's a huge investment for any Navy, let alone in Southeast Asia. It absolutely is, and it raises that classic opportunity cost question. Could that money have dot, say, a larger number of smaller, perhaps less sophisticated patrol boats, more coastal radar stations, more submarines, which Indonesia also needs? Exactly. It's a strategic choice. Indonesia is betting that the deterrence value and power projection capability of these two high-end frigates is worth prioritizing over maybe a larger quantity of other assets. A strategic bet, then. A bet that this kind of high-end deterrence pays off. Yes. And the success of that bet is conditional. Conditional on what? Conditional on Indonesia making that continuous long-term investment in everything around the ship. The logistics we talked about, the evolving doctrine for how to use it, the relentless training, and, importantly, partnerships with other navies. So the hardware... Impressive as it is. It's only half the equation, maybe less than half. The rest is sweat, smarts, doctrine, and allies. Okay, let's broaden out now. Geopolitics. How does this ship, this capability, change the dynamics in the region? The soft arms race you mentioned. Well, it definitely shakes things up within ASEAN. You've got Vietnam investing heavily in Kilo-class submarines. Singapore has its very capable, formidable-class frigates. Malaysia, the Philippines, they're also modernizing their fleets. But Brawijaya brings something new to the table. It brings that comprehensive package we discussed. The size, the range, the powerful sensors, and especially that full Aster-based air defense envelope. Many other regional ships, even modern ones, might lack that level of integrated, long-range air defense. So it elevates Indonesia's position. Considerably. It gives them a genuine capability to project power, not just defend their immediate coastline. Patrolling contested areas like the South China Sea near the Natunas, asserting EZ claims. This ship gives them reach and credibility far beyond their older vessels. What about China? How does this impact their calculations? It certainly complicates things for them, making incursions near the Natunas or pressing claims elsewhere in Indonesia's claimed waters. It becomes riskier. Because Brawijaya can see farther, shoot farther in the air, and stay on station longer. Exactly. It increases the potential cost and risk for any plan or Chinese Coast Guard vessels operating in those areas. It doesn't make it impossible for China, of course, but it significantly enhances Indonesia's deterrence posture. It's a clear signal. And the neighbors. Does this kick off a real arms race? Or something else? Hmm. Arms race might be too strong a term, at least initially. It's more likely to accelerate existing modernization plans. Okay. Other ASEAN nations will look at Brawijaya and reassess their own needs. Do we need better air defense? Longer range? Better sensors, it might spur an acceleration in capability upgrades across the region rather than just a simple tit-for-tat numbers game. That's sort of capability recalibration. Then. Something like that. We've seen similar things elsewhere. A significant jump by one player forces others to rethink their own posture and maybe cooperate more closely with partners. And speaking of partners, what about the bigger powers? The U.S., Australia, Japan, India. For them... A more capable Indonesian Navy makes Indonesia a potentially more valuable partner. For joint exercises, maritime security patrols. Counter piracy, protecting those vital sea lanes. Yes. A stronger Indonesian Navy contributes to regional stability from their perspective. Uh. But it also potentially makes Indonesia a more complex, maybe more assertive regional player, one with greater capacity for independent action. So it's a double-edged sword, perhaps. And internally, mm -hmm. within Indonesia, there's got to be a domestic angle here, too. Oh, absolutely. Investing in a high-profile blue water warship like this brings enormous national prestige. It's a visible symbol of Indonesia's rising status and ambitions. What the public expects results, right? Not just parades. Exactly. They'll want to see tangible returns, better security in their waters, protection of fishing grounds, a credible response to incursions. Any perception that this expensive ship isn't being maintained properly or isn't delivering real security benefits, that could be politically damaging. And that links back to the technology aspect, doesn't it? These ships are Italian design, built by Fincantieri. How important is technology transfer? Absolutely critical for long-term strategic independence. 
Indonesia needs to ensure the deal includes not just the ships, but the knowledge. What kind of knowledge? How to maintain these complex systems locally. The ability to perhaps build future vessels or components domestically, training for their engineers and technicians, access to blueprints, software codes. Because relying solely on Italy or any foreign supplier for every spare part, every major repair. It creates vulnerabilities. What if political relations change? What if a key supplier goes out of business or stops making a specific part? Building indigenous capacity, even if it takes time and investment, reduces that dependency. It's vital for truly owning and operating such a strategic asset long term. OK, so let's try and pull this together. KRI Broijaya 320. Is it just another warship joining the fleets in Southeast Asia? I think we can safely say no. It feels more significant than that. More like a potential keystone, something central to Indonesia's ambitions to be a real maritime power in ASEAN mm -hmm. and maybe even the wider Indo-Pacific. I think that's a fair assessment, potential being the key word there, because it's ultimate success. It's conditional. Right. Conditional on everything we've just discussed. Exactly. The hardware is impressive, no doubt. But it's only half the story. The other half is the continuous hard work, the training, the doctrine, the logistics, the funding, the alliances. Without that sustained, comprehensive support. Even this formidable ship risks becoming, well, underutilized, powerful, but maybe not reaching its full potential. So let's leave you, our listener, with a few thoughts to chew on. Provocative thoughts, maybe. First, will Indonesia's neighbors just watch this shift happen quietly? Or will they feel they have to respond with their own significant naval upgrades? Is an acceleration inevitable? Second, could this capability boost actually trigger a broader ripple effect, a faster pace of naval development across the whole region, really changing the balance of power for years to come? And maybe the biggest question for Indonesia itself, can they sustain this? Can they keep Brawijaya and its sister ship at peak performance, technologically relevant, fully crewed and ready for the decades of service expected? Or does it risk becoming, down the line, a kind of impressive museum piece in naval parades admired, but perhaps not the truly sharp, effective tool it was designed to be. Lots to think about there. Indeed. We hope this deep dive gives you a clearer picture of what's happening and prompts you to think more about geopolitics in Southeast Asia and just how maritime power is evolving right now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining us on the deep dive.